Hello internet, this is Whispering Lim doing another needle felting video for you today. Um, for those who have never experienced needle felting, uh, you use these kind of barbed needles, right? And I'm going to be poking wool. So if that's a sound that you like, then this might be a good video for you. And if it's not a sound you care for, well, like you, most of my videos are grocery hauls full of nice crinkles. So, <laughs> anyways, let's go ahead and get started. So what I'm going to be making today is a little felt donut. I had made some plain ones like this, just regular donut. And then I had also made a few um, donuts with faces. <laughs> and as soon as I had them posted, um, I posted them on my Instagram and into my Etsy shop. Um, as soon as I had done that, uh, one of my viewers here on YouTube, one of my friends here on YouTube, uh, said that they wanted to buy all of the ones uh, with faces on it, which is pretty exciting, but it also means that I need to make some more, right? <laughs> so, in celebration of the fact that it is because of my YouTube family that I am out of stock, I decided I would show you kind of how I make these. Now, the first step is to just get a regular old pipe cleaner and kind of twist it up into a circle, right? This will kind of give us a base in which to work off of. And then I have my core wool right here that we're gonna use for the first layer. Um, we use the core wool instead of jumping straight to a color because this stuff is significantly cheaper. It's a little bit off-white. This is kind of the um, natural look of wool before they process it, either with dyeing it or um, brightening it up. I don't think they use bleach, but I'm not sure entirely how they make white white. Um, and you can kind of see the difference if this camera allows. Uh, this is the natural off-white, and then this is one that's been brightened. So, there is a bit of a color difference. But the uh, core wool um, from my favorite supplier is about... I just did the math, too. <laughs> Let's see if I can remember. Uh, about two and a half dollars per ounce. You have to buy more than one ounce at a time, but that's what the price ends up being for an individual ounce once you divide it all out. And our colored wools, you know, that bright white or pink, um, brown, all of those are roughly three and a half, three and a quarter uh, dollars per ounce, something like that. <laughs> so anywhere that you can kind of tuck in this um, core wool, this off-white kind of stuff, uh, the better. You know, my donuts end up being about, I want to say about two and a half ounces uh, when they're all done. And, you know, maybe a little tiny, you know, one eighth of an ounce is that pipe cleaner. But uh, the rest of it is just wool. So... Anywhere that you can save a little bit is good. So, all I'm doing is I'm kind of tearing off little sections. You don't want to work with too much at a time. Um, if you do that, your shape will get uneven pretty quickly, in all honesty. Um, it's tempting to work with really giant pieces because in your brain you're going faster but you kind of have to go back through and fix um, your, your felting. You'll have to even it back out afterwards 
And that actually takes more time in the long run versus, um, you know, just, you know, nice low, small layers um, kind of overlap with each other and they'll make a smoother finish uh, when we get there. And all I'm doing right now is I am giving it a few little pricks just to kind of make sure it doesn't unravel. We'll do the majority of the felting once we've got a bigger chunk of wool on there. So it's pretty satisfying. Um, I think donuts are one of those things. They're oddly more time consuming than I prefer for my low end pieces, um, but they're very therapeutic. You know, the wrapping motion you know, just going around and around in a circle. Uh, it's pretty relaxing, so I enjoy making the donuts. Now, we'll see if um, this new batch sells. Sells? I don't know why I said that weird. Um, I have a I have a lot of cute little things. They don't typically do that well online, but they do do very well um, once I get back into um, craft fairs and, and conventions and such. I find that that's when my little pieces usually sell the best. And of course, um, 2020 wasn't a great year for doing craft shows and conventions, right? That's far too many people in one little space. Um, so it was kind of, it was an odd year. But, you know, the support that people have given me was more than I expected, you know. Um, there's been some family and friends and even my YouTube friends here who have been um, buying stuff and commenting or... You know, they follow me on my Instagram, and, um, you know, they've kind of made it so that even though it wasn't quite the sales year that I was hoping for, uh, I'm pretty sure I did not make a profit. I have not done my, um, <laughs> my taxes yet, so maybe I made a few dollars, but I think my material cost was pretty close to, um, the money I brought in. And the problem is, is, you know, I get kind of obsessed and I have lots and lots of wool colors. And so you have to stock, you know, lots and lots of wool colors. And then you start using them and then you get picky. You want that one specific blue, you know, versus the other blue that you might have, <laughs> you know, an extra ounce of or something. So it's tricky. I'm feeling mostly optimistic. Uh, this Chinese New Year will be the Year of the Ox. And I'm not a big astrology person. I don't attribute too much to um, any form of zodiac, whether that's the Chinese zodiac or... Um, I don't know what you would call the one that I think of as standard. The Western zodiac, perhaps? I don't know if it's exclusive to the West. Um, but anyways, that aside, um, the Year of the Ox is also my birth year. So if there's any, any sign out there that this will be my year, that might be it, right? So I'm feeling vaguely optimistic. <laughs> and in fact, I was so excited or trying to channel that good energy might be a better way to put it because excitement is a pretty strong word. Um, but I was trying to channel that positivity and I made a um, ox. Let me show you guys real quick. This impressive little beauty is my year of the ox ox. He has a wire base so all the little legs can be kind of adjusted a bit, although he doesn't really do much other than stand. Um, but 
but you could try. Um, <laughs> and he took a while. He was probably about 18 hours worth of work. And probably, goodness, he's probably close to like eight ounces worth of wool. So I had to price him kind of expensively. So I don't think he'll sell. I mean, I could always, you know, deny myself potential profit and and sell him at a more reasonable price, right? Because I did have one person interested and then they got really scared when they found out that I was trying to charge $150. Um, but that's just what you have to do. You know, any craft, whether you're a sewer, crochet, you know, jewelry maker, you know, because these things are available from the factory, you know, clothing or stuffed toys or what have you. Um, people get used to paying like Walmart prices for things. Whereas, you know, something handcrafted like this not only takes a lot of time, but it uses materials that those factories wouldn't be using, you know. If you got a stuffed donut plushie, right, from Walmart, uh, that would probably be, you know, 10 cents worth of fabric and another 10 cents worth of polyfill, right? And who knows how much their labor would be, maybe another 15 cents. Um, and then they'll turn around and sell that for $5. So it'll be a lot cheaper than what I'm making today, but it won't have the same soul. And honestly, I think my pieces have a lot of personality and I want to think that they're worth what they're worth and you know people do buy them maybe not as frequently as would be preferable but they certainly do buy them so I've had a decent decent time so I'm just kind of lining this up here uh, making sure that it's about the same size um, I try to keep them consistent in case people buy more than um, one at a time. They'll kind of, you know, go together as a set. It's real easy with felting to make everything a different size. In fact, I'm guilty of that when I make like animals like this. I'll quote someone at a size like this and then um, my pr proportions will get a little off so I'll build it up in a different direction and suddenly I've spent um, <laughs> way more on material costs than I planned um, but anyways we have the white layer pretty much all set right and it's maybe not quite as firm as I would prefer it in fact let's go ahead and just kind of tap this more if you are new to needle felting. Firmness will be like your enemy in the beginning because you'll start making shapes and it'll like look right so you don't want to poke it anymore, right? Because then you'll condense it. It gets more compact the more you poke it, right? Um, so you'll want to not poke it that much. You're like, oh, that nose is perfect right now. I'm going to stop right there. But if you don't poke it in nice and tight, make it nice and firm, uh, it will not hold up very well. You know, someone will play with it and maybe squish it in their hands and all of a sudden, all of that hard work, you know, starts to not, not really unravel. It's not quite the right word, but it'll, it'll loosen up in that perfect shape you were trying to preserve will um, quickly uh, morph into something a bit more general. Um, so, and another tip if you're using core wool like I am, you might think, oh, you'll stop a step and just make sure it's all nice and tight at the very end. Whereas you really want to make each layer pretty tight 
because when you put on the next layer, if this layer is super like fluffy, let's see if I can, you know, this is super fluffy, right? And let's say it's already the perfect shape. And I put this in, now adding that color is going to distort it anyways. Do you see how that's now pressed into uh, the fluffy stuff? Um, that's why you want it to be nice and firm before you add your next color because otherwise your shape uh, again is going to change whether you like it or not okay that's probably good enough though and what I'm gonna go ahead and do is that donuts they're kind of you know they're roundish but they're also kind of flattish right if that makes any sense um, right now, if I took a cross section of this guy, if somehow I could, you know, cut that and it would stay together, it wouldn't, by the way. Um, but if, you know, I glue it or something and then I cut it, it'll be almost like a perfect circle, right? If you can imagine that cut. Well, that's not exactly how a donut looks, though. Donuts have um, a very soft dough, so it tends to kind of, you know, be more of an oval, it flattens itself out. So now that I'm ready for color layer, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, add some to the center here before I do another layer of wrapping. And it's just kind of loose, it's all right. Um, but I'm kind of basically just extend, extending, words are hard, um, just extending that surface area out a little bit, and um, that will give a more satisfactory donut shape. I have lots of little things I do for the donuts uh, to give them a more accurate feel, <laughs> even though they're just kind of fluffy and cartoony. Um, I actually there's a couple of different ways that I think about the, you know, the, the, the nature of a donut. Uh, maybe that's my, my food background. I never had to make donuts uh, for any of my jobs. But I had to do like beignets and, um, oh gosh, other things that are like donut holes. I forget what they're called. Fancy. Fancy words for basically the same thing. Um, so I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with the process. Um, but more than anything, I am a lover of food, so I'm extra, extra aware of, you know, how it tastes. And usually aware of, um, you know, the basic ingredients, the basic process. Back in the, like early 2000s. I think my favorite type of show was cooking shows. You know, those were the Elton Brown and Iron Chef. Um, you know, the heyday of those kinds of shows. Which, they still exist now, but they're not, they're not like the pop culture phenomenon that I think that they were when I was younger. But, who knows? Maybe that's just because they were a bigger part of my life, I just assumed they were a bigger part of everyone's life. <laughs> it's weird getting older and finding which things were actually universally popular and which things were like, you know, school stuff. I remember when um, Pogs became popular. I thought that that was really random and I didn't understand it. Honestly, I never got into Pogs. Um, but I was pretty certain that it was just like this little thing, you know? It wasn't super big at my school. I was aware of it. People played it, but I don't think it was super big. Um, but then I come to find out, you know, years and years down the line that pogs were everywhere. And they started out in Hawaii. Um, pog represents a uh, fruit juice. It was like pomegranate, orange, and grape, I think, were the flavors. And so the original pogs were just caps from these juices. 
and they managed to make it all the way onto the mainland and I think even I think there were a few tournaments in my town so that surprised me because <laughs> they really were they were like cardboard discs how the heck did that get popular but people like what they like anyways we've got we kind of closed in that hole a little bit I think it could be just a tiny bit tighter not by much though because we're going to do another layer where we wrap around so that's going to make this hole even smaller you know because it's going to add surface area all the way around more uniformly uh, but I do want to make it mostly even it kind of goes back to having things firm right the more accurate your base is uh, the easier it will be to make that shape down the line, right? And you may notice that I have two different needles. I actually own quite a few different kinds of needles, but I find that I do most of my work with just these two. Um, the one that has kind of a green thing. Uh, that green up there, well actually the purple there, lines up with the purple on here. If I can get this out, there we go. So this is how a felty needle typically looks. Um, some manufacturers don't put the color coding on it. Um, in fact, the original person that I bought needles from did not color code theirs. So I color coded mine. Um, and so originally this size, which is a, um, let's see, I think this is a 36 spiral. Um, so I initially, um, put that size and I painted them green. That's the color that made sense to me. And I just used nail polish, um, on both the needle and the handle to kind of indicate which one it was. Um, anyways, long story short, I don't remember exactly where I was going with that, but, um, these little handles here, they come plain. Um, I get mine from livingfelt.com, um, but you can get them on a couple of suppliers. They make life so much better. And if you color them like I have, then you can easily tell which needle you have. I know um, a few felters who take pride that they don't need to color coordinate their needles. They just know. They pick it up and they know which one it is. But let me tell you something. To know what that is, you have to give it a few pokes and feel it and, and you know, kind of test it. Why waste that extra two seconds deciding which one it was if you could just add a color? So, uh, that's a spiral needle, and this is a star needle. It's a thicker gauge. I want to say it's, um, man, I can't remember the gauge. Maybe 40? Um, so this is more of a workhorse needle. It will take the wool and push it much further. It's really good for, um, kind of like tacking things on. Um, but because it is a thicker needle, right, and it's pulling more hair. You can see the area that I just used it on is a bit more dimply. You know, the uh, needle has pressed it in kind of in a very obvious way. Um, so I kind of alternate between these two because if I did it all with just this guy, I wouldn't like how the finish is. But this guy is a lot more dainty. You don't um, it takes more pokes uh, with a needle like that to get the same amount of, um, you know, condensing. Okay. So we're going to go ahead now and do another wrap. And this, you just kind of be kind of gentle with it. If you take this roving, right now the wool um, is in a step called loose ro roving. <laughs> Um, 
So it's not a fabric, right? I can pull it. In fact, I've been pulling on it a lot. Um, and it'll come apart. And that's a good quality when you're trying to build these kinds of things. But it does mean that when you are doing something like this, where you're kind of maneuvering it around a shape, if you get too aggressive and you start yanking on it, you just loosen it up. And then it's an uneven thickness. Um, so that's another little tip for you. I don't imagine most people <laughs> uh, are watching this quiet little video for the sake of, um, you know, learning how to make a donut. Uh, I really kind of envision uh, my average listener as someone who just wants to relax and learning a little bit about a new craft just kind of gives you something to focus on. So I don't feel the need to go super technical or detailed. You know, I just want to kind of introduce the concepts and maybe I admit there's a secondary goal. The more I can normalize needle felting as a craft, right, as an art form, really, uh, the more people will inherently understand the, the value of um, making a piece. Because as you can see, this is nothing like sewing. I think a lot of people look at, you know, all this cute fluffy stuff and they think, you know, it's a lot like... Um, you know, making a plushie. Um, a plushie, you know, they're a lot of work too if you're making them by hand, but once you have the pattern figured out, it kind of goes faster with each one because, you know, you're just making shapes and you're filling them in. Whereas this, you know, you're making the shape new every time. Um, so it's definitely a different kind of experience. I apologize that the um, the felting part where I poke it with the needle seems to be shaking my camera a lot more than intended. I thought I had finally solved that problem, but looks like I have not. Um, <laughs> I'm working up on an ironing board, and the camera is actually attached uh, to a table below. But because of my space constraints, I don't have a lot of room in this apartment. Uh, the ironing board is kind of basically just touching where the, the camera stand is. So. That and it's a pretty rickety little ironing board here. Let's see if I can move it away a little bit. Yeah, that might actually save the camera at least. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, I really only use it, I bought it just recently, um, so I really only use it, you know, sparsely. It doesn't have to be a very thick, sturdy ironing board, I guess. It's actually kind of a fun story by itself um, for Christmas, because I wasn't able to, um, you know, sell as much of my work as I was kind of hoping for, right? Um, I had a lot of shows cancel and everything. Um, long story short, for Christmas, I endeavored to hand make just about all of my Christmas gifts. Very few I did not hand make. And um, the result of this, of course, is that I was a little overwhelmed you know, when you think about all the people you give gifts to, um, and they all have already, most of them, gotten something felted before. So now I have to, like, you know, do the next level. And I just, to make each one special, and oh my god, it was so much time. But anyways, one, one of the few people I did not felt for was my fiancé. He already has some felted pieces, but also, um, basically he just kind of 
asks me to make one that interests him and then I'll make it and then it'll hang around for a month or two and then I'll sell it <laughs> or I'll try to sell it anyways as the story goes right now um, so he gets to see anything he likes to see in a felting form at some point um, so I decided to try to make him a game bag now not just like a tote bag not a backpack but like more of a portable shelf system because he has lots and lots of board games and he takes them over to people's houses and the problem with like a standard tote bag is it fits all the games but then you have um, you basically have to take every game out if the game you want to play is at the bottom. So I knew that something with like a shelf would be a good idea. And I got in way, way over my head. Um, I don't have that much experience sewing or constructing things like that. Um, I think I did sewing for like two weeks um, for home ec back when I was in high school. Um, so I didn't have a very strong background in sewing, and I most definitely, definitely did not have a sewing machine. Um, but I made this bag, and it's, it's actually kind of impressive. There's a few things I would definitely change, but it was all hand stone, sewn, you know, uh, backstitch with nylon thread because I wanted it to be strong enough, and... It was like a 3D shape with other shapes in it, so even if I had a sewing machine, I don't know how I would have done it. But um, he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it a lot. Uh, and posted um, on his Facebook, you know, a little video of it, you know, in action, and um, explained how I had designed and sewn it all by hand. Design is a strong word. <laughs> Like, I didn't create a pattern or anything. I just kind of cut fabric and sewed it. And if it fit, I sewed it again. And if it didn't fit, I'd cut it. And it was really, I'm not a very good sewer. <laughs> um, but uh, people loved it. They were floored with the fact that I had um, made this bag by hand, hand sewing. It was, it was, it was probably like 30 hours worth of work and anyways one of his friends um just thought it was the most ridiculous thing they were impressed but they thought it was kind of ridiculous that i had hand sewn um that whole thing so she just bought me a sewing machine like i didn't ask for it i didn't know this person that well i've met her you know i've met all of my guys' friends at some point, I think. Um, but, you know, we didn't hang out a lot or anything. And she went off and bought me a whole freaking sewing machine. I was just flabbergasted. Oh my goodness. Um, so back to the ironing board. I now have this sewing machine, right? I'm like, well, I would feel bad if I never learned how to use it. Um, I don't plan on making a bunch of these game bags. They were, the materials involved were pretty expensive. Um, and like I said, I hadn't made a pattern, so I'd have to figure it all out all over again. Um, but, you know, I still wanted to use the sewing machine and I am a crafty person, you know, even if I'm not experienced in sewing. Uh, I can kind of pick up new craft forms pretty quickly. Um, and I figured, you know, where else to start but by making a few masks, right? So I'm trying to do this and I find out that, you know, stuff that you intend to wash, right? You should actually pre-wash that fabric before you sew it you know, because of shrinkage and all of that funness, right? Um, so I washed a whole bunch of fabric and boy, I have to figure out a better way to do that because 
it like some of them tried to unravel and it was a mess uh, but they came out of the dryer like super super wrinkly it was it was regretful <laughs> how wrinkly they were um, and I do have an iron, which oddly enough I have for crafting, not for regular ironing. <laughs> um, so I set to ironing all these, you know, little pieces of fabric that I had collected and washed. And I didn't have an ironing board, so I was just kind of doing it on a, a low table. It was very, very low in a crowded little corner. Cause you know, one bedroom apartments, it's kind of hard to find room for things, right? Um, long story short, um, I was struggling <laughs> uh, to, to do everything and uh, burnt myself quite, quite good on that iron. And um, as soon as I had done that, I was like, yep, I don't care if I don't have space for it. I am going to buy myself an ironing board. Um, and as I was playing around with ironing, you know, because ironing takes a little while, um, the thought occurred to me that it would actually be a good platform uh, for doing these types of videos. It's always been a struggle for me, honestly, to find a good way to do... Uh, art videos because you want kind of like that overhead um, kind of camera view right and um, you want like I can't do sitting like when I do crafts sitting I get kind of bunched up and I pull everything close to my chest and that's not that's not very good for making a video <laughs> no one needs to see that um, so it's a struggle I think the last felting video I did, I did in the kitchen, and it took me like probably a good half an hour just to figure out a way to get the camera and the lights and everything um, into the kitchen in a way that would be good for this kind of top-down video making. Um, but now that I have the ironing board, who knows? Maybe I'll do more felting videos. I make no promises, though. Although, I confess, the fact that I didn't show my face on this one um, makes it a lot quicker, too. Because I don't have to, like, make sure my hair is nice or, you know, throw on a layer of mascara or anything. So that was good. Alright. I was quite the chatty Kathy there. So we have graduated from that brown, right, of the regular donut to the peak frosting. I'm just kind of making sure it's tight again, because when we add the sprinkles, you know, like I was showing you with that piece earlier, especially because they're little tiny things, um, it's very easy for them to get kind of sunken in the felting if you don't, you know get everything all nice and firm. That is like the main goal of needle felting, I guess. <laughs> Makes me cringe, actually. A lot of my older pieces were very soft and people have, you know, played with them, used them, whatever, and you can just see the age already on them. I'm hoping, now that I'm doing this more soundly, that it'll, um, these pieces will last a lot longer. So now, we're on to sprinkles. Sprinkles are kind of tedious, but they're fun too. I have this big old bag of um, basically scraps, you know, little pieces that I've pulled off during projects um, and didn't quite need everything that I pulled off. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna find some colors start with yellow here because that was nice and on top and I do have to kind of go through and pick out these little leaves that's kind of a standard thing you'll find in all <laughs> uh, wool roving is they almost always have uh, little bits of leaf still in them or sticks or whatever um, and as far as I know it's just unavoidable 
even this company, which I use a lot, and I think their product is very good quality. Um, they're, they're quick to point out that uh, vegetation will happen. You know, the, the sheep themselves, right? They're out having their best life in whatever pasture um, they're growing up in. So they're collecting leaves, you know, into their fur. And then when you comb it and wash it, if you do that too rigorously, I guess would be the word. Um, if you do that too much, you'll actually lose a lot of your product and it won't be a very good texture. So they have to accept some leaves being there. Okay, so what I did is I kind of made the base shape down here on my pad. Um, you know, back to that whole idea of you want everything to be nice and firm, right? Especially when you're attaching things together, right? Um, so I made the base shape down there, and then I'll find a random nice little spot. And when I do this, I'm actually going to go, I'm not going to go top down just yet. I'm going to kind of go to the bottom and poke it diagonally. And what this will do is it kind of forces the threads or the little fibers to kind of compact and it'll give you a nice satisfying 3D sprinkle. If you go too aggressively from the top to start with, it'll flatten out um, and it'll look more painted on versus, you know, as a physical thing that's separate uh, from the frosting. And there is a nice bright, happy yellow sprinkle. And we just get to repeat that process over and over and over again for, you know, all the sprinkles. I think I usually do about 10 per donut. Uh, it's not exact. Um, and I try to not be super even. Like if we look at uh, this chocolate guy here, he has three yellow, but only two white. And that, it's funny, it looks good when it's all done, but doing that like intentional randomness is super hard for me because I want to make it like even. So my, my temptation would be to have everything exactly the same space apart and the same amount and everything. Um, but I find that if you do it like that, you don't get that feeling that it's um, as random as a sprinkle should be. So I have to fight my urge to even everything out. And as you saw, I mean, it looks right in the end, but for like the first two, three colors, it drives me absolutely bonkers that, you know, I'll have such big wide open spaces or that it's not the right amount. Funny little things that can end up bothering you in the end, right? <laughs> I think I'm only gonna do two yellow on this particular donut. Yellow is such a strong color. Plus, I think blue is the best complement to um, the pink, so I'll probably do three of the blue sprinkles. Just tear off little chunks here. Oop. Try not to throw it everywhere. And it doesn't take much. In fact, this sprinkle ended up being like super oversized, so I gotta dial back how much roll I'm using here. And you'll notice that as I'm making this shape, I lift it up a lot. What's happening when I'm pressing down, let's do it a lot in one direction, is that you see how all those fibers are going that away? That's the direction that I was pressing in. So to get a nice good shape, you want to kind of pick it up roll it and kind of 
force the fibers to go in another direction. And the more you do that, you know, I've rolled this a few times now, the less that it pulls out each time. And that's kind of one of your signs that it's probably about good for using. Um, and with these, I'm going to be doing some of the, the felting right on the donut, right? So I'm not, I don't want them rock hard before I put them on because then they won't have any fiber that's willing to connect with the, the pink stuff below. So it's a balancing act. <laughs> And for the record, it does go a little faster uh, if I'm not doing it for the camera. And typically, at least with something like the donut that's very simple, and I kind of have a plan for it, um, I'll, I'll make a couple, you know, I'll do the, the white inner step for, you know, two, three, maybe four guys at once, and then I'll do the brown step, and then the frosting step, so. Anyways, my goal, <laughs> my goal for maybe not this year, this year might be, that might be a bit too much, uh, but soon, uh, next year, we could say next year, uh, is to start paying myself over minimum wage, because <laughs> um, right now I charge Basically, I charge like $8 an hour plus materials. It's not an exact charge because the way I actually decide it, because it's a little complicated to figure out exactly how much wool goes into each piece. So I take my time and I times it by 10. Um, and I find that if I do that, usually equals $8 dollars for me and two dollars for material and that seems to be pretty consistent actually because um, you know a certain amount of wool is pretty much going to take the same amount of time to felt up you know if you have an ounce of wool if you're trying to get medium firm and it's probably going to take you half an hour or so uh, to get that wool into the right shape now that process does kind of fall down a little bit when we get into super complicated pieces like I did a, um, a fox not too long ago. Super cute fox. Um, and his, like he doesn't use as much of this stuff. This is the, the wool roving. Um, he has more of um, top coat. There's all sorts of different kinds of top coat. There's coriander which I think is my um, most common type. And there's merino. Um, but anyways, it looks more hairy than this stuff does. This stuff looks kind of like teddy bear stuffing, right? It's a good way to think of it. Um, but the, let's see, I'd have, this is not a great example of it. I don't keep a lot of it in here, unfortunately. Oh, I do have some scraps. Look at that. So you can see how this is much longer if I pull at it, you know, whereas that one would have come off in a chunk. This comes off as like a really frizzy, gunky little thing. Anyways, with a long haired critter, um, the labor costs would actually be higher than what I'm putting it at. That's all right. It's really tricky uh, figuring out prices for stuff because, you know, a lot of, you know, well-meaning people will tell you that you should be making at least $10 an hour and that, um, you know, you're a skilled person. They're paying for that skill. And that's true. People are paying for your skill. Um, but if you don't have a following and no one understands what that skill actually is, it's really hard to get a lot of people to understand. 
what, you know, is going into that. And also, you have to consider, you know, this donut, if I wasn't doing it in front of the camera, would probably take me mm, just over an hour to make. Maybe an hour and a half. Right? Um, possibly a little longer than that. I've noticed that I'm starting to take longer. Anyways. Point being is it doesn't take me more than two hours. Let's say that. That might be a more accurate estimate. <laughs> um, someone who's new to needle felting and kind of doesn't understand the material, they probably could follow along with what I'm doing in the video and replicate this donut, right? They probably could do this exact donut, uh, you know, without too much heartache. But because they're unfamiliar with the material, you know, and, and my way of working and everything, it might take them, you know, let's say four hours to make a donut uh, through needle felting if it's their first go around. Um, so does that mean that their donut should be worth $40? Not really, because on the flip side of what effort you put in, there is the retail standard, right? Now I charge uh, about $13 for a single one of these if it's on Etsy, um, and that's just to cover my uh, shipping costs and everything. But if I were to sell it in person, probably about $10. Uh, I made these um, after uh, COVID happened, so I don't know. I haven't had to price it for in-person sales yet. Um, but, um, so I can, I, I charge, I would charge more than, you know, say if you had found a, a little stuff animal, a little stuffy at the dollar store, right? You might be able to find a donut, stuffed donut at the dollar store. Um, you know, knowing that even if people don't understand needle felting, they understand homemade is different. But I certainly couldn't charge $30 for one little donut, right? So, yes, it's tricky. It really is tricky. I've gotten a lot faster this past year um, making all my needle felted creations, right? So I'm actually getting closer to, you know, making stuff quick enough that I can sell it at a reasonable, not a reasonable rate, because I was selling it at, boy, what am I trying to say? I'm starting to get into the felting zone. I'm losing track of my own thoughts here. Oh yeah, I'm making myself sleepy. Maybe I'll just go ahead and uh, be quiet while I do these orange sprinkles. How does that sound? That might be good. Let you enjoy the poking without my ramble. That's apparently extra rambling. hard to be quiet. <laughs> okay, that's enough quiet time, I think. <laughs> I, uh, I'm the type of person that if I'm listening to ASMR, I'm not really the, um, pure noise person. Definitely need someone talking. 
channel, so I just kind of feel awkward because, like, I know someone's out there watching this video. And I, there I am, just being all super quiet, like I'm, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it feels more voyeuristic that way, I think. If you're really quiet. Strange perceptions. Although I'm not, I confess, a super big ASMR person. Like, I enjoy it on occasion, but it's really my fiancé that got me into it. So, and he listens to ASMR every night, all night long. I had to buy him special headphones. <laughs> They're those um, fabric, like a headband type deal that have really thin, thin speakers. Um, and he's at that point where he's so used to wearing them that he can wear them pretty much all night long. It's crazy. These are definitely some chunky, chunky sprinkles on this one. You can kind of see on here they're, they're close to the same size, but they're just a hair bigger. It's weird how it changes how much the, um, the donut gets filled up. It might actually be more efficient, although it looks extra cartoony when they're that giant. I normally add some white ones, but I'm actually, in order to keep the balance, um, I might skip them just for this guy. And also, I'm getting kind of tired of standing here. <laughs> so we'll want to move on soon. Now a real quick, quick note. Um, I have a towel over my felting pad uh, because it is hideous. It wasn't a very pretty color to start with. It was like um, a mustard brown, like a yellow brown. Um, but I use it a lot, a lot, a lot. So it's gotten little bits of other colors in it. Um, you know, just, it looks so ugly. It's still functional, but it looks super ugly. And I just couldn't abide by that for a video, you know, especially because for the first half, I imagine a lot of people will have their eyes on the screen. Probably not at this point, but, you know, in the beginning. Um, so I covered it up with a towel, and I would not, like, it's okay for, for you know, a temporary deal, but I would not recommend using a towel overall as a felting surface. Um, mainly because the, the, the fibers get kind of sticky in there, and it also is kind of wearing down towel a little bit. You can see this is the area I've been working on uh, the most. And it's, I, I can tell that it's getting roughed up. So, plain old felting pad for me when I'm not doing a video. Okay. Okay. We can finally, finally get to the best part, which is making the little faces. So let's go ahead and put all of these scraps away. We won't be coming back to that. Let's see if I have some white light hiding in the bag. Oh yeah, that's the white light. As opposed to the not white white. <laughs> Grab some black. And we'll just see how I feel here. So to make the eyeballs, I'm going to tear off two sections and I'm going to kind of feel, you know, especially when it comes to like spheres that need to be even, you know, in the case of eyeballs, um, you'd be surprised on how little wool, you know, little ex, you know, too much, you know, a pinch extra will change the overall size quite drastically. Um, so I try to pull both sections um, at the same time so that I can kind of feel them and they feel similar. It doesn't 100% of the time, 
prevent me from needing to adjust them, but it helps a little bit. And just like with the sprinkles, I'm kind of rotating this around, pulling it out of the towel because it's getting felted into the towel a little bit as I poke down here. And uh, constantly rolling it will also make sure that it's relatively round. If you were to like, you know, just take this big old hunk and start felting it straight on to the donut, you could probably get a circle, but it wouldn't be as 3D as what this is going to be. So, kind of going for a medium firm. And we want it to hold its shape when we add it to our donut, right? But we don't want it to be so stiff that there's no extra hair fiber, rather, that uh, can be pushed in. I try, when I talk about felting, to call it fiber, because that's less icky <laughs> to people. <laughs> but let's be honest, this is indeed sheep's hair that, um, you know, was grown on an animal in a farm. Um, it's weird how disconnected a lot of people get uh, from that sort of a thing. Enough that calling it hair is distasteful, despite, you know, the obviousness of it being hair. Uh, I find the same sort of thing happens when I tell people uh, to not throw out their bacon grease. It's that same kind of thought process. Like, do you really think it's all that better to, to let that resource go to waste and then get olive oil in, instead? I mean, there will be a slight nutritional difference, I'll admit, but resource-wise, you might as well uh, use it. But anyways... It's not so much that I'm trying to be eco-friendly that gets people. They just somehow, because it came off of an animal, despite the fact that they want to eat the bacon part, they think that uh, eating the fat part is gross. Even though these same people have, you know, vegetable oil in their cabinet. It's crazy. People are weird. Um, but anyways, we are starting to attach our eyeballs. Just like with the sprinkles, I'm kind of going down towards the bottom first. Just kind of make sure that there's a nice base and it pulls all the fibers to be even more circular or spherical than they were before. And that looks about right. We'll do it again. And, um, Looks like I did have to add just a teeny, teeny, tiny bit of hair, uh, extra wool to one of the eyeballs, but overall they're pretty close in size, which is nice. If they're only just a tiny bit different in size, you could obviously um, just poke the larger one a little extra, you know, even though it'd be a slightly different firmness, no one's really going to notice, and it'll help. Uh, shrink it down, so to speak, but I don't think that's going to be necessary for this one. Not at all. You'll notice that I take care to kind of flip this upside down. Um, really, the strongest felting bond is going to be when you go in all directions. You know, just think how much more tangled up your hair gets if the wind blows it from both sides, right? It gets pretty tangled. Kind of a similar thing. Not really. <laughs> that was a bad example. Okay. Now, unlike the sprinkles where I wanted it to be 3D, I don't want the pupils to be 3D. So, I'm going to get roughly the same amount, but I'm not for once going to shape them down on my pad. I'm just going to kind of line it up where I think I want it. And I'm going to poke right in the center. 
and I kind of sweep the uh, little floaty bits around kind of in a circular motion like this and tuck it in and that'll help me form a pretty accurate circle and like I said I want the pupil to kind of sit in the eye so I'm letting the pressure kind of squish um, the white felt underneath the black felt and voila we got one eye challenging part is always to make the other one look like it matches somehow. Sometimes that means that I make um, intentionally cross-eyed uh, pieces because they're easier to match if you do it like that. He's going to have a bit more of a centered, almost vacant stare. At least it's going to look vacant until we add some other identifying um, bits of expression, right? I messed up my circle just a tiny bit. He's gonna behave. No, it's not gonna behave. Oh, I thought I was gonna get it perfect, and you guys would think I was like amazing. Uh, if you, if you end up trying needle felting yourself, you'll discover that this is actually, it's far more impressive to get a good circle like this than I'm making it look. It's actually pretty hard to do when you're first starting out. You get the hang of it eventually. Okay. And I think... <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> he looks so perturbed. I wonder if I should make this one my grumpy guy. Last uh, batch, I think the white glazed donut was my grumpy one. Do I want him to be sad or grumpy? Sad? Worried? Hmm. Choices, choices. Let's make him grumpy. That's what I think I want. So we're going to grab some of this brown. This is, you know, the same color as his bottom side. So in a sense, this is his flesh color, right? And we're just going to kind of do, I'm going to poke in the center here. Then I'm going to kind of lift up and poke again. And this creates kind of like um, a more solid edge, right? So there, this part's kind of straight and flat. And we've got a floopy part right there. I'm going to do the same thing here. Kind of press it in the middle and lift it up and poke it down. And having that nice straight edge will just make it bit easier to make a reasonable little eyebrow here. Oh yeah, he's going to be upset for sure. Let's see here. I might have made these a little too long. Let's see if I can poke it back this way just a little bit. Oh yeah, there we go. That's going to be about right. He doesn't look nearly as grumpy as the last grumpy guy I did. That's interesting. A lot of times when I make the expressions on these guys, I just kind of go with the flow. Like sometimes I plan on making one specific type, but more often than not, I just kind of notice that it's starting to look one way or another, and I'll kind of change what I'm doing based on, I don't know, the perceived emotion that's already there. If that makes any sense? I think my problem is, is that I made those pieces too long. So it's becoming like more of an eye socket than an eyebrow. That's definitely what's going on there. Hmm. I could still make him happy. That wouldn't be out of place. Make him worried. A little sad pink donut. Oh my goodness. Let's do a sad pink donut. I don't think I've had a, a sad one yet. Let's 
take a little bit of his frosting color. I'm just gonna kind of roll it up. And that'll get me kind of um, a cord, if you will. And we're just going to add a little bit of pink up here. And now I don't even know what I'm going for. Should I make it a curl donut? Maybe that's what I want. I confess I did think about it earlier. It's like bright red lipstick. That might be fun. So much for grumpy, right? Change my mind all the time. It kind of looks like eyeshadow more than an eyebrow. That's okay, because we're going to make this a girl donut. That's what we're going to do. I have decided. This is the final change in my plan. <laughs> it will be a girl. I have declared it so. Just adding a little line here for her mascara. Oh yeah, I think I made the right choice. Look at that. And same kind of thing, I'm just kind of twisting a little bit. That helps get the, the fibers all in one direction and a little more um, well behaved when you're trying to do kind of a line work thing. This is a little thick, so I'm gonna tear that. Never be afraid to, to tear off if you have too much. Oh, getting them to match is the hard part. Well, that's pretty close. You may have been um, taking advice from a clown. It's okay though. She is a donut after all. <laughs> Poor thing. I'm just kind of, since I decided that these are no longer eyebrows, they're just eyelids, I'm kind of compressing that brown back down into more of a you know, proper shape here. You see, <laughs> little vacant eyed. She's gonna, she's gonna look something, something weird. Do a little, little cupid's bow, or maybe a heart, maybe a heart shaped lips. Might be good. Valentine's Day is coming up. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. And go up on this side. When you're trying to do really complex shapes, you kind of want to break it down. So I'm only trying to do half of the heart to start with. And then take another little floof here and go right there for the other half. <laughs> now she looks much more happy if, you know, maybe she's had a little bit too much Botox or something though. She looks a little uh, creepy, actually. That's okay. Sometimes it's fun. <laughs> oh, she's so awkward. Just because she's so awkward, I'm going to give her a chin. Most of my donuts don't have chins, but she needs one. She looks like a plastic surgery gone wrong. Firm up a little bit here. <laughs> Poor thing. Oh, I feel bad. She should have had such a different expression. 
and this is the one she's getting. But I find with these really goofy expressions, they usually sell pretty well, so maybe she'll find a, a home. Oh yeah, she looks like someone's like grandma that's ready to like hit them with a shoe. <laughs> oh, okay guys. I, I make better faces. I think I think the camera and talking and, and everything got to me. But we're just gonna leave it at this point because I've been doing this for a while and I'm ready to sit down and move on with life. And I've probably said as much as I feel willing to say. And now my phone's going off, so... Okay, I said I was done, but I lied. I just... What do I want to do? I think I just want the mouth to be more even. I think that's all I need. I'm going to add just the tiniest, tiniest bit of extra floof right there. Yeah, that doesn't improve anything. Okay. You know what I am going to do then? To kind of prove that I can make better faces, I'm going to show you some of my other work real quick. Just a, just a little tiny bit. <laughs> Here is that fox that I was telling you about, who has the long hair. That took quite a bit of time. And he has a darling kitty. Um, and then, like, for more simple stuff, I have faces like these, right? <laughs> or for, like, um, you know, this kind of style of eye, I can do different shapes and stuff. I, I don't know what happened here. I know that she looks very scary, and that someone is going to buy her just because she looks weird. I promise you this. I find that all of my, like, weird mistakes like this are some of the first things to sell. <laughs> Anyways, um, I really do need to uh, wrap this up here. So let's see here. Next step, of course, is the shout outs. So first, of course, uh, thank you to Sharon, who bought three of my donuts, three of my better looking donuts. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I will link my Instagram down below and my Etsy shop just in case someone else wants to make my day. <laughs> um, other than that, thank you to Jana and Hot Sauce 188 for commenting. I uh, really appreciate it that you guys still take the time uh, to comment. So without much further ado, I'm going to say goodbye, good night, <laughs> and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.